Um, thanks everyone for zooming in. Today, I'm here to introduce in vivo imaging core. It's a CTSI core under the umbrella of uh, Indiana Institute for Biomedical Imaging Science. And uh, I will cover broad imaging applications using the core equipment, but feel free to reach out to me or any of the core member if you wish to know more in depth of a particular imaging technology or discuss how to initiate an imaging study or simply just uh, brainstorming any uh, imaging study you're thinking and interested in. Uh, please uh, reach out to us. So I'll start with brief overview, introducing the imaging core personnel and equipment. Then I'll focus on a variety of imaging technologies. The imaging core has uh, three major components. First is a clinical component for human imaging and a preclinical component for large and small animal imaging. Also, we have molecular imaging ligand development program at BRTC, uh, and it's led by Dr. Scott Snyder. This ligand development program develops customized molecular tracer and ligands and we could probably focus more on this component in a future CTSI session. The location of in vivo imaging core is at a three campus uh, location and the four buildings. First is the Research 2 R2 building. And we also have scanners at the Goodman Hall and the Neuroscience building. Also, the ligand development program is located at the BRTC program. And uh, it's a kind of triangle and each distance is about one to two miles. The core is staffed with different professionals and led by IBS director, Dr. Gary Hutchins and scientific, scientific director, myself. We also have financial uh, officer and IT support and also engineer. For the clinical component, we have ORI business manager uh, led by Jason Shine. We have uh, uh, MRI and the pet technologist and also mm -hmm. the uh, supported by MRI physics, Dr. Cho Ting Wen. For preclinical component, especially the small animal imaging facility, uh, it's called Roberts Translational Imaging Facility, RTIF. It's a joint venture between IBIS and SNRI led by Dr. Bruce Lamb. This uh, preclinical imaging um, facility is fully operational for uh, two years now. And uh, we've been supported by uh, the administrative support, uh, Kylie, James, and Tammy, also by um, various uh, physics, near Dr. Nia Wang, uh, Lei, and Samang, uh, MRI physics, and uh, Elizabeth about the paid imaging. Our equipment located at Goodman Hall, we have a 3T Prisma MRI scanner for human studies. Also the same location, we have a vision uh, PET CT scanner for clinical human studies. At the R2 location, we have a same thing, 3T Prisma fit MRI scanner for human and also large animal studies. And uh, um, at the same location, R2 also have a PET CT called MCT scanner for both human and large animal study. The preclinical small animal study is located at the neuroscience building we house Bruker 9.40 PET MR scanner. This is a, a 9.40 scanner. Uh, it's a 30 centimeter board magnet. This is a cylindrical uh, board, it's a magnet, and we have a, uh, the bed here. Uh, the same facility, we have a PET insert. So uh, the insert will um, uh, add into the board and we can perform the simultaneous 
simultaneously PET and MRI scan. Uh, we also have a cryoprobe, uh, a state-of-the-art uh, receiver coil called cryoprobe. It's using cooling system to minimize the electronic noise. This can in return uh, to boost uh, the signal to noise ratio and or uh, imaging spatial resolution. Using the cryoprobe and compare with conventional coil, the left imaging here, this is a mouse brain uh, using cryoprobe. With the high signal to noise ratio, we can see the more uh, fine structure compared to conventional service coil. This is another sagittal view of the same brain. As you can see, you can see a fine structure here compared to previous conventional service coil. Uh, this is also for small animal imaging, uh, this uh, service coil for the mouse and the rat brain and the whole body volume coil. This is how we perform the small animal imaging. We put the um, mouse on the cradle and uh, at the same time, because they are under anesthesia, so we have a hot water bed to uh, maintain their body temperature. They have a tooth bar and also ear bar to hold their head and uh, um, to minimize motion artifact. Last, uh, we will put on the service coil to detect the signal and the whole thing will slide into the magnet to prepare for imaging. During the imaging, uh, we will constantly monitor the uh, animal vital sign. And according to this, uh, adjust the isoflurane level. Similar for the human scan, uh, all the scanner, including MRI and the PET scanner will have a similar shape here. It's a uh, um, cylindrical shape with a, a central uh, board, we can slide the bed in uh, with subject on the bed. So with this equipment, uh, we can provide imaging service for uh, PET images. Uh, the left side, these are um, typical PET imaging. Uh, for this particular tracer is AV45 amyloid PET tracer. And we also provide MRI imaging. Uh, the, this image here is a T1 weighted anatomical scan, uh, T2 flare scan, and the button, the color is a, a color map from diffusion imaging and the flash anisotropy also from diffusion imaging. For the mouse, on top image here is anatomical scan. It is a T2 weighted scan of a mouse brain. Uh, with uh, control and a stroke model. On the bottom here for mouse PET scan, uh, we have FDG PET. So here uh, we have, uh, I have a video, let me switch to, okay, so. Uh, and uh, I'm showing here is the time revolution of uh, uh, the dynamic intensity change over time um, after the injection of the PET tracer. Uh, this PET tracer FDG is measuring the metabolism of the tissue and the higher uh, or harder uh, imaging intensity, meaning in the tissue area that has a higher metabolic rate. So for the PET imaging, uh, we can provide tau imaging, amyloid beta imaging, which is uh, uh, detecting the Alzheimer's disease um, and the metabolic imaging that I just showed, the uh, FDG PET, perfusion imaging, also the prostate specific membrane anti antigen imaging, and other neural oncology or dopamine imaging. Uh, so to to uh, detect this particular physiology or functional change of the brain and the body, 
we need a spatial pet tracers. Uh, these are the tracer we offer from the imaging core uh, with uh, F18 isotope, we can have FDG, FET, and et cetera. Uh, for uh, N13 ammonia, C11, we have uh, acetate. Also, uh, PIP is another different amyloid beta tracer and other tracer as well. Uh, O15 is uh, labeled in the water. And uh, so if you are interested in a uh, customized uh, tracer or a ligand, uh, please contact Dr. Scott Snyder. Um, he can discuss with you how to uh, label particular ligand with uh, uh, this isotope to create imaging intensity for PET. Uh, these are typical PET imaging in the animal, uh, small animal study. On the left side is the uh, red brain with FDG, again, uh, metabolic rate. So uh, I'm showing here is the revolution of the location of the brain, a different slice is location. And the intensity here describing the metabolic rate of that uh, location of that tissue. On the middle here, uh, this is uh, uh, also a crossing slices uh, of the whole body FDG PET images. On the right hand here is a uh, uh, temporal resolution of the FDG PET. Uh, here is a typical tau PET scan for uh, targeting at a tau tango. Uh, it is a, a hallmark of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And the uh, BRAC staging uh, is a uh, uh, stage the uh, severity of the Alzheimer's disease. So as you can see at the BRAC stage zero, we have a minimal tau uptake here, meaning which is uh, normal. And uh, at the early stage, we can see an uh, increased intensity of the tau uh, uptake in the medial temporal lobe. And uh, at the later stage, we can see a uh, more higher intensity uptake and also this kind of abnormal tau tango extend into posterior and even to anterior part of the uh, brain. And uh, uh, about the MRI techniques, the, uh, here I listed this uh, basic MRI technique meaning these are anatomical scan uh, using uh, T1 weighted contrast or T2 weighted contrast and T2 flare and T2 start. These contrasts, they are created by uh, tissue intrinsic property and the T1 weighted imaging spatially enhance the fat tissue also uh, mildly native one meter. Uh, T2 weighted imaging is uh, sensitive to water content in the tissue. T2 star flare similarly to sensitive to water content, but it removes the interference from the CSF uh, of the brain. And the T2 star weighted imaging is sensitive to iron content or the susceptibility uh, property of the tissue. So this is a, a, a T1 weighted uh, contrast. Uh, the contrast is taking the, uh, the intrinsic uh, tissue property of uh, T1 relaxation time. Uh, different tissue, they may have different relaxation time. So if we take a snapshot of uh, the image, we can see uh, the tissue because of this intrinsic property, they create a different uh, level of uh, imaging intensity. Because of different level of imaging intensity in the on the image, we can see uh, different contrast. The one meter is a high intensity compared to gray meter intermediate intensity versus uh, uh, CSF is dark here. Uh, similarly, and a T2 weighted contrast is uh, to image 
or take the advantage of the tissue intrinsic property called T2 relaxa T2 relaxation time. Uh, it's the same thing uh, if we take a snapshot at uh, uh, optimal timing, then we can create a uh, highest tissue contrast, uh, for example, between 120 millisecond to 160 second. Here we can create a very clear uh, the different three different tissue type here, the CSF, which is has high intensity compared to low intensity one meter and a gray meter. Uh, similarly, the anatomical scan can be performed on the small animal. Uh, here, Dr. Nia Wang, he did the uh, T1 weighted scan. Uh, in this case, we particularly interesting in the spinal cord here and the spinal cord root. Uh, also, the same animal, we can perform T2 weighted scan and uh, focus on the spinal cord. And here, the CSF is uh, uh, at high intensity, but compared to T1 weighted, the CSF is uh, it's dark here. So uh, using a combination of a T1 and a T2 weighted imaging, we can uh, decide the tissue property and uh, make proper diagnosis. Uh, this is a stroke model uh, imaging by uh, Dr. Lei Zhang. Uh, in the upper row, we can see the stroke, uh, especially on the right-hand side of the brain. Uh, we have a abnormal high intensity uh, representing the tissue death or local edematous change of the brain because of the stroke. Uh, this is uh, compared to the normal intensity in a control mouse. Uh, using these uh, differences in the imaging intensity, we can perform our eye based volumetric measurement by delineating the uh, borderline of the vision. And using this technique, uh, we can um, create a three-dimensional volume uh, describing the vision. So here uh, in the, the blue uh, ROI uh, stack up, we can see the three-dimensional, the extent of the vision uh, from the stroke. Uh, uh, in addition to uh, our eye region of interest based analysis, we can also perform volumetric measurement using uh, voxel by voxel based analysis. Uh, in this case, uh, Dr. Saman Shahid is using voxel based morphometry uh, approach to detect the uh, volumetric differences between two groups of animal. In this blue area, it represents a statistically significant decreased one meter region between the two group. And in the um, red uh, voxels here, uh, representing statistically significant increase in the uh, volume between the two group. Uh, using the contrast between different tissue type, we can perform gray matter parcellation. And here you can see a different color represent different functional uh, gray matter area. We can also delineate a gray matter and a white matter boundary and study the morphology of the subbrain suckers for brain development. Also, we can perform segmentation. This is an example of a segmentation of the uh, hippocampal subfields. And, um, and also enlarged view on the right side. Um, advancing to these uh, um, more advanced uh, MRI techniques, here, I will introduce the uh, resting state functional MRI, diffusion MRI, 
a little bit of uh, MRI spectroscopy and the angiography. But uh, the MRI uh, of the in vivo imaging core, we also routinely perform perfusion imaging, quantitative susceptibility imaging, modeling imaging, and contrast enhanced imaging. So the uh, resting state MRI is uh, to look at the, uh, the temporal fluctuation of the imaging intensity and see how this temporal fluctuation uh, under uh, so-called resting status that uh, whether they have a particular correlation from one voxel versus the other voxel. So as here, you can see for the green voxel, uh, it's uh, over time. Uh, signal fluctuation looks like a random. Uh, but as if you if we compare with the, the signal fluctuation with the orange voxel here, we can see they seem to some similarity and uh, if we actually do the correlation uh, between these two curves, uh, we find the correlation coefficient is 0.84, which is quite high. Uh, then how about the orange voxel with the other, for example, the purple voxel, it looks that these two voxel has really small uh, or minimum correlation. So by uh, correlate individual voxel across the whole brain, uh, researchers found that uh, this is a surprising discovery that some of the brain area, their temporal fluctuation uh, under the resting state they seem to have high correlation. Uh, seems that in during this resting state, this group of uh, brain voxel or group of brain uh, neurons, they seem to synchronize with each other, meaning that they may be working with each other. So uh, getting this uh, correlation map, we call this group of voxel, they belong to the same network. And these are the uh, seven network that uh, we can um, detect from uh, resting state fMRI. And they actually uh, match some of the brain uh, functional area. For example, the visual cortex and uh, auditory cortex and secondary visual cortex, et cetera. Uh, this is an uh, uh, exercise done by uh, one of my group member, uh, Ria. Uh, he's looking at the independent component uh, of uh, a group of mouse brain and, and uh, uh, see if they, we can detect a functional meaningful network. Um, also, um, we can use a similar uh, strategy, meaning by uh, correlating um, the brain voxel with each other, meaning that if we can identify a seed, seed voxel first uh, in this particular experiment, we are interested in whether the amygdala uh, connection or amygdala connectivity with the rest of the brain, whether that connectivity has a differences between two group. The two group is um, opioid exposed infant versus non-opioid exposed infant. And here that we see the amygdala connectivity uh, has abnormally increased connectivity in these red uh, brain voxels and but has uh, abnormally decreased connectivity with these blue brain voxels. The next topic is uh, diffusion MRI. So um, as uh, we know that the uh, water molecules, they are not stationary, they move all the time. And the diffusion MRI is to make imaging uh, the human brain pathology by detecting the random motion of the water molecules. Um, as you can see on the button here, this is an example of isotropic diffusion. At the uh, beginning, most of the water molecule, they concentrate on the original location. Uh, but over time, these uh, water molecule, they may diffuse to a far distance. 
and the uh, probability of for finding a water molecules at a particular diffusion time and the distance, the curve may look like this and it will evolve over time. If the water molecules, they are trapped uh, inside a particular brain, uh, a brain uh, micro environment, uh, for example, here is uh, the uh, axonal membrane, the myelin sheath, then the water molecules, they may have uh, its uh, favorite direction to diffuse and the diffusion, uh, the shape will become a so-called anisotropy. This is a cartoon example uh, illustrating the diffusion process. Over time, and the ink molecule, they will diffuse and eventually fill up by reflecting the shape of the container. This is a different shape of a rectangular container. So using this uh, diffusion property, uh, we can detect the, the shape, the size of uh, the uh, diffusion uh, using MRI. Uh, a very convenient mathematical description of uh, the shape is using so-called diffusion tensor. A diffusion tensor is a three by three nine element tensor. Uh, it's actually a symmetry, so it only has it only has a uh, independent six component. Uh, we usually diagonalize it to get its intrinsic uh, principal eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So the eigenvalues, not the one, two, and three, describe the shape uh, of the diffusion tensor. Uh, as you can see, described in the shape and the size of the uh, underlying tissue uh, compartment. And the major eigenvector here, uh, especially the primary component, now make uh, E1, describe the uh, principal orientation of the diffusion direction. So using a combination of these three eigenvalues, we can define a secondary matrix, imaging matrix. For example, a fractional anisotropy is to look at how different the three eigenvalues uh, from each other. If uh, one of the eigenvalues, for example, lambda one, is much higher than lambda two and three, the variance between these three values is really high meaning the fraction isotropy is really high. So in this case, it describes a very elongated diffusion, meaning that uh, the boundary or restriction of the tissue microenvironment is very narrow. Or we can uh, average the three eigenvalue to get averaged size of the diffusion, and this is called mean diffusivity. Mean diffusivity describes the average the diffusivity, or you can think of average the diffusion speed. If uh, uh, we have a, a higher speed, meaning that the tissue has uh, more free water, uh, the water restriction is really low, so the water can diffuse freely and faster. The axial diffusivity is basically the lambda one, meaning the uh, principal direction diffusion speed. And this has been linked to axonal integrity in previous animal study. And the radial diffusivity describing the perpendicular uh, water diffusion speed, it is an uh, average of a minor and uh, uh, median uh, eigenvalue. And uh, in previous animal model, it is grabbed, it's uh, connected to myelin integrity. So on the bottom, we can see the image of the fractional anisotropy. You can see the high intensity in the one meter area describing this uh, uh, area has really uh, uh, <clears throat> an isotropy diffusion and uh, the diffusion direction is highly restricted to only one direction. However, in the gray matter or even in the ventricle area, the uh, anisotropy is low, 
meaning the three eigenvalues equally size with each other, and uh, um, meaning that the water diffusion is isotropic. Um, <clears throat> And in the uh, mean, mean diffusivity, we can see in the ventricle again, uh, because here we don't have a tissue boundary or restriction. So that the, uh, the water molecules, they diffuse faster compared to those water molecules in the grand parenchyma. That's why they create high intensity in the mean diffusivity. In the axial diffusivity describing the uh, diffusion Mm, speed parallel to the axonal direction. So we can see the it has a high intensity in the um, compact one meter area. But it also has high intensity in this uh, ventricle area. The ventricle area stay the same high intensity in the radial diffusivity. But however, in the anisotropy uh, compact one meter area, the radial perpendicular diffusion is very restricted so that we have a, a darker intensity here in the internal corpus, internal, uh, internal capsule and also corpus callosum. Um, in addition to the scalar map for diffusion MRI, we have uh, directional information from the major eigenvector. And uh, uh, we can um, color code the major eigenvector three component into uh, the red presenting left and right direction, green present representing anterior and posterior direction, blue for superior and inferior direction, so that we can uh, project the three dimensional information in the two dimensional map. And we can, by uh, reviewing the color, can easily uh, grab the idea of the underlying fiber orientation. Uh, if we can enlarge the color map, we can see that at, uh, at the um, individual imaging voxel level, we will have uh, one major eigenvector direction representing the underlying fiber orientation here. If we can uh, trace, trace the uh, major eigenvectors from one voxel to the next voxel and so on and so forth, we can, can then uh, connect a streamline. Uh, this is a one streamline, but we can repeat doing the same thing for all the voxel, then uh, we create a streamline tractography. Mm -hmm. um, this image here, uh, Dr. Shahi, he conducted streamline tractography to uh, to study the uh, connection of uh, desert locust. It's an uh, insect and uh, uh, the, their brain connection from the middle of the brain and their uh, fiber projection to their retina uh, um, area. And uh, uh, this is uh, another study. We perform a uh, whole brain tractography uh, from cortical to cortical uh, area. And uh, by using a certain filter, uh, in this case, we have a one meter voxel with increased mean diffusivity. Uh, so we use these uh, yellow voxels to fill, filter out uh, some of the one meter tracks. And uh, we can see these uh, particular streamlines and the label by their family, one meter track family, uh, with four set minor in orange and the green representing superior corner radiata, and the uh, um, blue is posterior corner radiata, and the uh, red is a singular. Meaning, this fiber track they have a, a vulnerability and uh, has uh, increased uh, mean diffusivity along the fiber track. Uh, in this concussed uh, athlete compared to uh, contact control. Another study utilizing the tractography is uh, uh, to look at the um, association pattern between the uh, PET imaging, the tau deposition 
uh, in the brain gray matter and uh, uh, associate with the vulnerability the, or you can, uh, if you will, the integrity of for the Y matter track. In this study, we utilize the uh, network uh, graph uh, theory and uh, uh, reduce the gray matter area into the knot area and the size of the knot representing the, um, the concentration of the tau deposition. And the Y meter track connecting different knot uh, as a uh, edge here and uh, come by association between the tau deposition in the uh, knot or gray meter area with the Y meter integrity detecting by the diffusion imaging, uh, we, can, um, we can find the association pattern. Uh, this is a different study looking at the preclinical um, Alzheimer disease uh, animal model. And here, the agenda of this project is to look at the hippocampal subfield and how the diffusion um, major differences in, the, in this uh, the, um, hippocampal subfield. And uh, uh, also, uh, on the left side, the image here, we can see the uh, zooming and to see the individual voxel and the stick representing the underlying tissue uh, orientation. And uh, from here, we can already see uh, uh, the, the tissue orientation has a, a very different um, organization in uh, the hippocampal subfield. This is uh, the yellow region, uh, it's a uh, dainty gyrus, and uh, this part is a uh, red region, is a CA1, and uh, then this part is a uh, green region, is a CA3. Also, uh, very briefly, uh, in our imaging core, both clinical and preclinical, we have been developing uh, MR spectroscopy uh, on the left side, uh, this is a uh, uh, spectroscopy spectrum. And uh, um, using the spectrum, we can fit into the, uh, the curve and uh, count the, um, to get a concentration of uh, individual metabolite under the each peak. So as you can see here, we can have a th uh, three GABA peak and uh, um, NAA peak here. Lastly, um, we've been developing the uh, angiography for the preclinical study. Uh, this uh, angiography is by injecting the contrast to enhance the vasculature of the uh, animal brain. I believe there's a, a video here. Okay, there's no video. So uh, that is uh, all uh, my presentation, uh, just uh, a very broad uh, review of the all different kinds of imaging application uh, in our imaging core. If you want to learn more about the uh, service item or contact information, please um, search our website here. And also feel free to email any one of us if you have any related questions. Uh, the last slide here is just a funding opportunity because uh, imaging study could be uh, quite expensive. So uh, these are three uh, pilot grants that um, people can consider to acquire and uh, uh, to initiate your imaging study. Okay, uh, I think if, let me know if you have any questions. Great, thank you, Yu Chen. I will just add to the funding opportunities. There's also a, a postdoc uh, funding grant uh, through CTSI that um, is, I think, five thousand um, dollars that might uh, be available to also. So it's something to consider. Um, if anyone has a question, you can feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it in the chat, and we'll we will answer it that way.
Looks like we have a lot of shy people. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll throw in a question. This is Rob Tepper, I'm one of the Peds pulmonologists at Riley and also do research in the Well Center. And do you know the current status of MRI for um, um, assessment of airway size and caliber down the airway tree? Uh, CT scans are currently the cold standard uh, because of the degree of resolution, uh, but it's not as much of an issue in animals and people, particularly pediatrics, the radiation becomes uh, an issue. Um, and MRI, I think, has been used for very large airways and upper airways. Um, any thoughts of the current uh, ability to detect, um, you know, uh, first 10 generations or so of the airway tree? Yes, that's a, a really good question. So the airway tree, we need to uh, in, uh, inhale a special gas called uh, it's XE. Uh, so that can create MRI signal. And uh, uh, for that inhalation, we need a special device. Currently the in vivo GMCO, we don't have that device but it is something we can develop and uh, purchase. But uh, I do know um, a graduate from UW Madison, so they have a really big group there. Uh, Dr. I believe, I believe Sean, uh, he's developing um, these uh, airway imaging and uh, large airway, small airway and uh, long imaging using this uh, special gas. Uh, so we previously published a paper together. So at the, the technique is uh, mature and out there. It just, uh, um, we should be able to, uh, to develop that uh, in the IU in vivo imaging core here. So even with development, I guess the question I'd have is, um, is it anywhere close to the resolution and um, of, um, um, CT imaging. Uh, so even under the best research conditions, I um, guess is um, how well can you do? Right, I think the, uh, the CT MRI resolution, uh, if we can have the contrast ready, the resolution is about one millimeter by one millimeter uh, isotropic. So uh, I'm not sure about CT, I think it's probably in a similar range. I think so. So, I, okay. Uh, yeah, that should be enough for uh, for for uh, displaying the large airway. If we want to look at the tissue uh, at a cellular level, probably is impossible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, not so. the cellular level. But I think there's yeah. always questions in terms of um, cystic fibrosis, asthma, children born mm -hmm. premature. That you have to get past the trachea for it to be mm -hmm. of importance because it's really airway development. Um, yeah. And uh, where could I, I guess, could you um, send me that article? Should I just reach out? I guess I'd like to have some idea of under the best case scenario um, mm -hmm. with um, using xenon, um, yeah. you know, has anybody done studies comparing the two or the ability to resolve how many generations of the airway tree? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Uh, let's connect offline and I can definitely send you several papers. It's, it's a, a very mature techni technique out there. So um, happy to continue communication. Okay. So there's a question in the chat. Can you image animals that are implanted with the metal, for example, platinum electrodes? Um, Yes, uh, with the uh, metal, um, with the platinum, I think, uh, so uh, MRI, because we have a high magnetic field and uh, uh, ferromagnetic material is, is particularly uh, dangerous to put into the scanner. But uh, uh, other metal, we can imaging other metal using quantitative susceptibility imaging. Uh, to detect these other metals, uh, their uh, concentration or even the the uh, the effect of how this metal create uh, using MRI. 
So the uh, short answer is yes, but the long answer is it depends on uh, what you want to detect. Ho I hope that answer your question. Um, any other questions? Uh, there's a one about uh, the small animal pet and MRI. Uh, what age of the mouse will be used? Um, right, so uh, we've been scanning uh, the animal from age. For, for rat, we've been scanning from seven, seven days old. Uh, until, um, uh, yeah, as small as seven days old until they are, are super old. <laughs> and uh, for mouse, uh, the youngest one we've been scanning is uh, uh, one month old. It's four weeks old. Can you do younger or that's just as young as you've done so far? Uh, that is the youngest we've done so far. I think it's a, not a matter of uh, limitation of the MRI technique, it's more of a limitation from whether the animal can sustain the uh, anesthesia and isoflu ran. So, but uh, if for, if for ex vivo, then we can do whatever age uh, that doesn't really matter for ex vivo imaging. And we do do is vivo imaging, although our core is called in vivo imaging. <laughs> but yeah. Any other questions? I don't see any on my end. Do you have any uh, U10 and yours? No. Okay, well, I want to uh, thank you again for presenting. It was very clear. You have a lot of really beautiful images. Um, and uh, I'm sure if anyone has more questions, they can uh, feel free to reach out to your core directly and in, you can connect with them that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Jill. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you.